will come back and ting and ting and ting. I'm Mr. Giant, and today, today we're going to watch Destruction of the Kiev, Destruction of the Kievan Rus, the Mongol Conquest. So yeah, this one sounds really interesting and ting, man, yo. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer. It is the spring of the year 1223, in a small wooded village of Zarek, by the banks of the Lower Dnieper. There, surrounded by his retainers, sits the haughty Mstislav III, Grand Prince of Kiev, a title that had long since ceased to have any real meaning. He looks upon a group of ten envoys, hardy, irritable men, not unlike the other heathen nomads in appearance. They demand the swift extradition of Kumans that had fled into his lands. Mstislav scoffs. Who are these men to make demands of him, the Grand Prince of Kiev? If these Mongols wish to make trouble, then so be it. With a flick of his hand, his Trujina steps forth and cuts down the envoys. It was a dark time for the Rus, but little did they know, it was about to get much, much darker. <laughs> Shout out to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video and being our most loyal partner. We've been enjoying our Magellan TV subscription and hope that our viewers love it too. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that has over 3,000 documentaries, among them hundreds of historical documentaries. We're excited to announce that Magellan is now offering a buy one, get one free gift card for the people in your life you want to give the gift of knowledge. Go to our link in the description, press our banner, and take advantage of this limited offer for our viewers. Purchasing a gift card any time of the year will also give you an additional month of Magellan TV for free, even if you're a member. Now is the time to try it and share it with your friends and family. Magellan TV also has a phenomenal selection of historical dramas, and if you're interested in the history of Russia and want to delve into it, you'll find no better TV show than Ekaterina, Rise of Catherine the Great, which describes The best part is Magellan TV is offering a one-month free membership trial to our viewers. If you haven't signed up to Magellan yet, support our channel and do that at try.magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals. You will get a free one-month membership trial. The early Mongol stories of the Kievan Rus are almost always overshadowed by what came afterwards, the arrival of the Mongols. By the year 1223, the great horde of Chinggis Khan, a man Genghis who needs no introduction, had exploded across Central Asia, Northern China and Iran. Brilliant generals Subutai and Jebe made the Kumans the latest victims of the Mongol advance, forcing them to flee into the lands of the Rus Ignoring the Mongol warning not to interfere in an affair that was not theirs, the Grand Prince made the fateful decision to side with his Kuman allies, arrogantly ordering the execution of the envoys, changing the course of Russian history forever. On May the 31st, an army of 40,000, made up of the various Rus princes and their Kuman allies, clashed against a Mongol army less than half its size at the Kalka River. We have covered this battle in detail in one of our past videos. Subutai exploited the disunity of the princes, using Mongolian heavy lances and mounted archers to extremely Joy. deadly effect. The armies of the Rus were ultimately surrounded and massacred. For defying the Great Khan, the Grand Prince Mstislav and other nobles were slowly crushed to death beneath a wooden platform. Afterwards, Subutai returned back east. However, now the Mongols had intimate information on the lands, politics and armies of the Slavs, and as such, the disunited principalities of the Rus were living on borrowed time. In 1227, the great Khan Chinggis died and was succeeded by his son Ergede. Reinvigorated by new leadership, the Mongols spent the next few years finishing off the Khwarezmian and Jin empires. In 1235, Khan Ogade convoked a Kurultai of his princes and generals, and determined that their next theatre of expansion was in the lands of the Kuman Kipchaks, Volga Bulgars, and of course, the Rus. See, I didn't know that uh, 
I've learned something new, y'all. I didn't know Genghis Khan had a son that continued in his conquering ways and thing, you know. And now he's going after the Rus. There's got to be more uh, in-depth information about him. So I'm going to have to look him up, you know what I mean? Because it's quite obvious that he continued what his father started. The invasion force that was mustered was led by Subutai the mastermind behind the victory at Kalka River 12 years earlier, and the up-and-coming Batu, the grandson of Chinggis. By their side were many other grandsons of Chinggis, including Guyuk and Monker. Oh, the reason for such a star-studded invasion force was simple. As Khan Ogade's brother, Chegatai, had warned, there at the end of the world, they are hard people. They are people who, when they become angry, would rather die by their own swords. Wow. The Mongols refuse to underestimate the people of the West. In the autumn of 1236, a 100,000-man army was assembled That's in the Mongolian one. heartland, consisting of an ethnic Mongolian core and contingents from Uyghurs, Tangans, Kitans and Jurchens. This force was composed predominantly of nomadic horsemen, but also included elements of Chinese siege engineers to bring the walled cities of Rus to heel. China in the the great horde of Batu and Subutai set forth, and the traditional enemies of the Kievan Rus, the Volga Bulgars and the Kumans, with whom the Rurikid princes struggled for centuries, were put beneath the Mongol boot in less than a month. The Rus principalities were in a terrible position. As we covered in the last episode, they were notoriously disunited. Prince Mstislav III of Kiev had been influential enough to stitch together a coalition of princedoms to fight Subutai's initial expedition in 1223. But even this army had fought as separate units, loyal to their various princes, a drawback that had cost him the battle. Thus, when Batu entered Rus' lands, he saw not a united people standing against him, but a row of dominoes, ready to fall, one by one. In December of 1237, the Mongol horde reached the city of Ryazan, which although direly outnumbered, resolved to mount resistance against the invaders. It took only five days for the city walls to be breached by Chinese catapults. The slaughter that followed was recorded in the contemporary Chronicle of Novgorod, in prose that reflects the horror of the age, they like Is it me or are we seeing the same superpowers? The Chinese, the Russians uh, are still there, you know. And uh, as I'm watching this history here, these history videos here, I notice that uh, uh, the Arabs have a part to play in it too. There's just this whole conglomerate of, uh, of uh, nations or peoples that are conquering the world, getting conquered, conquering the world again. And, and today, like I said, you see the Chinese are very uh, prominent in the world and the Russians are still very prominent in the world. The, the only new uh, new peoples in there is the, from here, the Western world, you know what I mean? But uh, they've been over there like going back and forth for centuries, man. That is, that is something else, you know what I mean? And I have to wonder what was Africa doing in the meantime. Apparently, some of them had conquered Africa too, you know what I'm saying? This is, this is quite interesting. Likewise killed men, women and children, monks, nuns and priests, some by fire, some by the sword. They violated nuns and priests' wives, good women and girls in the presence of their mothers and sisters. It should be noted that Yuri Vsevolodovich, Grand Prince of the great city of Vladimir Suzdal, stood by and did nothing while Ryazan burned. While the ruling Prince of Ryazan was killed in the massacre, his brother, Roman Igorovich, managed to escape, fleeing with his Trujina along the Oka River, doggedly pursued by a contingent of the Mongol army led by Kolgan, the son of Chinggis. It was here that Prince Yuri of Vladimir finally intervened, deploying a contingent of troops to rescue the fleeing Rus noble. They How many bloody children did this Genghis Khan have? Did he just like <laughs> go through the whole region, just uh, procreate? <laughs> I mean, a son, a grandson, a son, a grandson, all over the place, but my man is just 
going uh, his, his ancestors is just going through they reap and havoc you know havoc to the people that they are they they are they conquer but to him the victory you know or he's in the name of the family and thing like that that's that's crazy they made their stand at the town of Colonna, where they were defeated and killed however in the fighting Colgan was struck down his death would mark a watershed moment in the mongol invasion some historians postulate that Grand Prince Yuri had planned to submit to the Great Khan, and his surrender might have inspired other princes to do the same, sparing them death and destruction. Domino effect. Now that option was off the table, as the death of Atingasid was something that couldn't go unpunished. During early 1238, the Mongols campaigned across much of the northern heartland of the Kievan Rus, committing numerous atrocities across multiple settlements, They're including mad. the sacking of an irrelevant little town known as Moscow. The great city of Vladimir Suzdal was attacked in February, only to fall three days later. Yuri fled north, but was run down by a two men of Mongol vassals at the Sit River, in an engagement more akin to a slaughter than a pitched battle. With his death, so too dies the hope of any united Russian resistance against the enemy. Realizing that, Batu Khan split his army up into contingents, ordering each to wreak havoc across the northern Rus. Wow. Over the next few months, 14 cities fell and were subsequently subjected to mass murder and destruction. There were a few key components to the Mongols' success. Firstly, the Eastern Slavs had avoided building their settlements on high ground for centuries, and the flat terrain surrounding their sedentary cities made them easy targets for Mongol siege weapons. True, true. Secondly, Chinese siege engineers used advanced catapults, which were extremely effective in bringing down the timber and earthwork walls of a typical Rus city. Thirdly, and most importantly, was the constant disunity of the Rus people. So entangled were they by their rivalries that they were happy to watch their neighbor destroyed by the Mongols, only to be surprised when they were struck next. To cope with this utter destruction, the Rus came to see the Mongols as not just another foe from the steppe, but as a supernatural punishment from God. Thusly said in the Chronicle of Novgorod, God let the pagans on us for our sins. We always turn to evil, like swine ever wallowing in the filth of sin. And for this, we receive every kind of punishment from God. And the invasion of armed men too, we accept at God's command as punishment for our sins. <sighs> that is not to say that every living Slavic soul in northern Russia stopped resisting. One such example is the tale of the 12-year-old boy Prince Vasily of Chernigov, who against all the odds managed to hold out in his capital city of Kozelsk for nearly two months with only a citizen old. militia, even managing to lead a successful sortie outside of their walls where they slaughtered thousands of Mongol troops, destroyed siege equipment, and cut down the sons of three Mongol commanders. But they could not delay the inevitable. Kozelsk soon fell, and Vasily was slaughtered alongside every single one of his subjects. Seems like war was a family affair down there, you know? People went into battle with their sons and, and stuff like that, you know what I mean? It was like a family affair going on there. That is uh, crazy, you know? Like, like, seems like uh, influential people went off to war. They don't do that much anymore. They just uh, say, hey, well... And why should we? We should just let the poor people do it, you know? You know, instill a, a sense of patriotic, patriotic, patriotism in them, you know? And I'm not saying that it's not prevalent now that some uh, influential people's kids don't go off to war, but you see that less and less, yeah, you know? Uh, they usually uh, get the masses to go out there and do that vibe, you know? Nevertheless, the child prince's valiant defense left such an impact on the Mongols that they came to call Kozelsk the evil city, and none dared mention it in their presence. Furthermore, Russian folk tales are full of defiant but ultimately doomed attempts to stymie the Mongol advance. 
One figure whose story emerged out of the Mongol campaign is Evpati Kolovrat, a Rus Bugatu, whose story is the archetypal Rus tale of honorable vengeance. Evpati was visiting Chernigov when his hometown of Yezan was put to the torch in the winter of 1237. Returning to see his home a charred husk and his people dead, he swore bloody revenge against Batu Khan. Scrounging up a small army of 1,700 survivors, wow. he pursued the Khan, attacking the Horde's rearguard and annihilating thousands of Mongol troops. In response, Batu Khan sent his relative, Kostovrul, to hunt this mysterious enemy. If Pati killed Kostovrul in single combat, and then began cutting down the dead general's entire retinue in a blood-drunk fury, oh. before finally being slain from afar by siege weaponry. As the tale goes, Batu Khan showed a begrudging admiration for Ifpati's bravery, and as a sign of respect, returned the warriors' bodies to his soldiers and allowed them to return to their homes. In truth, stories like that of Prince Vasily and Ifpati are romanticized to varying degrees. Nevertheless, there is at least a kernel of reality in these tales of Russian resistance against Mongol domination. After all, Kievan Rus was a nation founded by warriors, so it is not unreasonable to believe that there were brave souls among the Eastern Slavs who were willing to make the Mongols bleed for every inch of land they took. In the autumn of 1238, Batu withdrew to rest his army, leaving behind the ruined northern Rus. The grasslands of southern Russia, Ukraine, and the fertile northern coasts along the Black and Caspian Seas remained untrampled for now. Along the Dnieper's banks stood Kiev, the Man. cultural heart of the eastern Slavic world, the mother of cities, an opulent memory of a golden age long past. After a brief rest, Batu Khan's campaign continued, thundering across the Pontic steppe. After subjugating the diverse peoples of the Crimea and campaigning against the Circassians in the Caucasus, they turned towards the Rus. In March of 1239, the city of Pereyaslavl was put to the torch. Chernigov was next. Unlike many others, the men of this city rallied outside the walls to bravely face the Mongols in a pitched battle. Predictably, they were slaughtered. After this, the walls were breached and the general citizenry were subjected to wholesale massacre. Thus, the gateway to Kiev was <laughs> opened. The Mongols were fully aware of the cultural significance of Kiev and the power and prestige it had radiated for centuries. By this point, Kiev's prince, Mikhail of Chernigov, had fled to Hungary leaving his voivoda, Dimitro, in charge of the defense. The Mongols had sent envoys demanding submission, but Dimitro had those envoys executed. And, of course, by now, we all know what that meant. Oh, yeah. After a brief detour to subdue the Iranian Alani, the Mongols returned to Kiev in the winter of 1240, crossing the frozen Dnieper and laying siege to the city. The city's walls were quickly rendered into rubble by Chinese catapults, and the invaders poured into the city. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand street fighting occurred, and Dimitro was eventually forced to fall back with his defenders to the Church of the Blessed Virgin, while the civilians took refuge in its walls. As scores of terrified Kievans climbed onto the church's upper balcony to shield themselves from Mongol arrows, their collective weight strained its infrastructure, causing the roof to collapse and crush countless souls under its weight. By December 6th, the struggle was over, and Kiev was in Mongol hands. In a rare act of clemency, Voivoda Dimitro was spared his life in recognition of his bravery, but the rest of his city was not so lucky. Wow. Of a total population of 50,000, all but 2,000 were massacred. The city itself was put to the torch. Of some 40 significant landmarks in Kiev, only six remained standing wow. after the wrath of Batu. For centuries since the reign of Prince Yaroslav, the peoples of the Kievan Rus had been divided, but the idea of a common culture and a common empire remained. 
Now, with the mother of Rus cities a smoldering ruin, the nation founded by Rurik was dead. Kievan Rus was no more. After Batu Khan's campaign, the northern Rus lands were completely and utterly devastated. And while the south was not hit as hard, its major power centers, most notably Kiev, had been destroyed. Pockets of independent Eastern Slavic resistance would continue on for the better part of a decade, particularly in the westernmost region of Galicia Volinia. But by 1250, the entire former Kievan Rus was completely under Mongol domination. The socio-cultural impact that the Mongol invasion had on the Russian and greater Eastern Slavic worlds cannot be understated. It would not be inaccurate to equate it to the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the Germanic tribes. Before the Mongols, the cities of the Kievan Rus had been a land of saints and scholars, the heirs of a once united empire rivaling other civilizations of Europe. Afterwards, it had all been reduced to smoldering rubble, a pale shadow of that glory that Crazy. had once been, a conquered people living under the yoke of foreign warlords they considered to be the scourge of God. However, among all that wreckage and ruin, a certain settlement remained untouched by Mongol wrath. It was the oldest of the great Rus cities. In our next episode in this series, we will explain how Novgorod not only survived the Mongol invasions, but thrived under the rule of the Khan, and cover the rise of the charismatic Prince Alexander Nevsky as he submits himself to Eastern overlordship to combat new threats emerging from the Germano-Latin West. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our Wow, wow, did they just that's total annihilation. But I guess the the, the mentality then was uh, in order to win a war or completely take control, you gotta to totally destroy. Totally dem demoralize people, you know what I mean? And just like pretty much get rid of their, their culture and their, their landmarks and things that they hold dear. You know, the next generation isn't going to grow up knowing all that stuff unless uh, word of mouth history is told. And of course, like they said in the video, some of them have been romanticized, with, which kept that uh, nationalism, I should say, for lack of a better word, to be, you know, in there. And, you know, that's kind of understand because, you know, I have a lot of uh, Russian subscribers and uh, they are really wary of people attacking them. They're really wary of that so if they were taught all of this in history that's to that's totally understandable which you could equate that to you know how africans feel in the west you know they, they feel well this is the slavery has happened to us and it could happen again so they're totally aware of it you know and they, they keep it as something as a reminder of what could happen if people don't pay attention anyway man Thank you all for watching this with me and thing. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll leave a link in the description. You could go uh, go check it out there and thing. You know what I mean? Or check out uh, Kings and Generals. Good stuff. Good stuff, I tell you. Real good stuff. You understand what I'm saying? In the meantime, in the meantime, take care of each other, okay? we got to stop making the same historical mistakes and start making peace and love the order of the future. You understand what I'm saying? Take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.